now we're happy to be joined by Lipum and CEO uh, Anna Pontaine. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, you know, Lipum, we have an ambitious goal. We struggle to improve the quality of life for all the millions of people uh, affected by chronic inflammatory diseases. And our approach is based on a scientific finding of a protein called BSSL. This protein was first found in the mammary glands in breast milk and its role then in breastfeeding of infants. But later on, the Lipum founders recognized that this protein is involved in the inflammatory pr process and it's found in the circulation. And an illustration of this is when you study arthritis model called collagen-induced arthritis. Uh, this is a model where you, uh, by, by in adding collagen, the arthritis develop. And it's measured by scoring. And as you can see here, for wild-type mice, when they are um, treated with collagen, the scoring or the arthritis develop. However, if you study mice where are genetically modified that don't have this BSL molecule in the, the circulation, they are completely unaffected. It's also seen that these mice, the knockout mice, they are just as healthy otherwise and have just uh, the same uh, life expectancy as the others. So it doesn't influence their immune system that they are deficient of the BSSL molecule. And, and this led to the idea that you could treat with blocking the BSSL molecule. And in this model, it's a pristine induced arthritis model on rats, where you can see that rats that get an injection of a buffer solution or blank solution, placebo, they get heavily ill. But those that get an anti-BSSL antibody are significantly less affected. So, with this background, Lipum decided to develop a therapeutic, fully humanized monoclonal antibody. That work resulted in the SOL116 uh, that now has passed all the steps of development. It's, uh, we have a, a cell line development, we have a master cell bank, we have a production method, we have even uh, the drug products filled in vials, and it's ready for use in clinical trials. SOL116 was uh, seek patent protection in 2020, so we expect to have a patent protection until 2040. The mechanism of action, uh, of course, we study this heavily in different kind of models, and roughly it's related to BSSL's role when it's released from granulocytes. It binds to monocytes and stimulates the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and the migration of monocyte uh, that uh, maintains the inflammation. So by inhibiting BSSL in this process, using SOL116, we expect to prevent migration and so thereby also the inflammation. We are soon about to enter into clinical phase, so then it's a good reason to look backwards a little bit. The company Lipen was founded in 2010, and after a number of years with preclinical work, there were a collaboration with SciLife Lab for the development of SOL116. Later on, this led to a commercial collaboration with Absea our development of Master Cell Bank and production method. And um, in two th late two th 2020, we started a collaboration with Charles, Charles River Laboratories to uh, conduct the so-called non-clinical program or TOX program, so called uh, quite often. And just recently, we signed an agreement with the CRO company QPS that has already been initi initiated in the preparation for the first phase one uh, study. Meanwhile, we have been funded by uh, governmental seed investors, European Union by Horizon 2020, and pr uh, private uh, investors. And one year ago, we were listed on NASDAQ First North and raised 85 million. So altogether, it has been invested around about 150 million in the company so far. 
the shareholders signed last year a lockup for six or twelve months, and um, essentially no one. Uh, uh, it was around about ninety percent of the shareholders. Uh, essentially, no one left. But one major change was that uh, the governmental seed investor Alme Invest. Uh, according to plan, they sold their shares, and these shares were acquired by Fleury Invest, that is uh, a well-known life science investor. The, the founders and the management still holds around about 20% of the ownership in LIPO. We have a highly dedicated and very experienced team. Uh, I'm very happy about this project group, where we have specialists in each, each position. And also that we have two of the founders still working in, the, in this project group. The board of directors is led by Chairman Ulf Björklund, that previously was uh, CEO of Aprea, that was uh, sold to the US VC investor 5AM. And Ulf was also CEO of Oxypharma, that uh, worked with a, a compound called Rabeximod. Nowadays it's uh, further developed by uh, Sykesone. In the management team, uh, beside me, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, I've made exit previously. We also have Pernilla Abramson that also made the previous exit from her, her company. We have Susan Lindquist that is one of the founders and we have Marina Norberg that is a uh, former uh, auditor at PVC. We have more recently uh, reviewed our, <coughs> our opportunities in this market and we have concluded that our lead indication should continue to be the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, for regulatory reasons we may then later on also explore our opportunities in the rare disease juvenile adipatic arthritis. But um, considering the opportunities in RA <coughs> we also see that there is a group of indications we call expand indications one that is Crohn's disease, ulcerous colitis and SLE. These expand indications we may consider for phase two trials later on. There is also a group of indications that we have a denoted second group and these are <coughs> diseases there is a high medical need, we have some uh, preclinical results and we, we include them in the indications of interest, but we will only invest preclinical efforts in, this, uh, in these indications so far and, and then rather look for partners for, for the continued development. Looking into the RA market, it's huge. It's around about 27 billion US dollar today. It's expected to be uh, 29 billion US dollar in 2029. Uh, the growth rate is leveling off a bit and it's expected to level off even more. It's still growing, but the reason is that uh, for some of the major anti-TNF biological drugs like Umira, there are now patents expiring and biosimilars are introduced in the market. The biosimilars are uh, slightly uh, less expensive, but still there is not a major price uh, decrease due to the introduction of the biosimilars. There is also a group called uh, kinase inhibitors or uh, JAK inhibitors. Um, <coughs> the, the, the future of those is a little bit uh, ambiguous because FDA just uh, recently reported on a uh, safety study conducted of patients having RA and ulcerous colitis and there were re they found reasons to add uh, uh, additional box warnings on the JAK inhibitors uh, and not only on these on, on, on trial at that, in that study, also on others. Uh, assuming that, uh, that it's related to the mechanism of action of these drugs. So <coughs> there is a huge market, but there is also <coughs> uh, limitations of these uh, biologicals, uh, the uh, anti-TNF biologics. And it, this is a rather heavy slide where you can see a summary from uh, a Journal of Clin Clinical Rheumatology. Uh, and 
if you look into the red box here, you can see that this lists the ACR50. ACR50 is, according to the American College for Rheumatology, it's a 50% improvement in the disease. Uh, then looking into uh, the, the joints and, and some other parameters of the patients. And uh, the drugs here listed are the more advanced biologics and also the JAK inhibitors. To the right hand side you see the adjusted number for improvement, the, number, the percentage of patients that experience a 50% improvement uh, reducted for the metatrixate uh, uh, as, a, as a reference. And as you can see, there is uh, only around about 30 to 40 percent that achieve this goal. Uh, and in addition to this, there is also with the anti TNF drugs a large portion of the patients that actually are non responders that have no effect whatsoever. So if we look into the market, we, we see there are around about four to five million uh, having the diagnosis of RA. Out of them, around about 1 million receive uh, biologics, and 30% non responders means that with 300,000 patients that are non responders, we estimate that there is a market opportunity for LIPUM about 1 billion US dollar. And this is for the, one, uh, the TPP1. <coughs> we could also assume that we, if we head on uh, being a, f a, f a first line alternative biologics, then of course the market opportunity is much higher. So now we plan for our first clinical phase, our first clinical study. It will start during this year. Uh, obviously, it's a safety study. So the primary objective is to study f uh, safety and tolerability of SOL116 in uh, healthy volunteers. But also in this study, we will include one cohort with patients having uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And the secondary objective, it's rather standard, it's the pharmacokinetics, also in the patients and, and the healthy subjects. But we also have an explorative uh, objective where we will look into uh, monitoring our target molecule BSSL and we will also monitor inflammatory biomarkers in both healthy volunteers and in the RA patients. And we hope that the results out of this study will be giving us uh, additional guidance in the planning of forthcoming studies of SOL116. Uh, I mean, the ultimate goal is then, of course, to go later on come into phase two study, where we study the effect of SOL116 uh, um, on RA patients. So our strategy to create value is to take care of all the opportunities of our main asset, which is the fully humanized monoclonal antibody SOL116. So first of all, we plan for clinical studies. Uh, in the first instance, this year we start safety studies, phase one, but later on we will do the proof of concept study in RA. However, in parallel, it's equally important for us to continue to study, first of all, the mode of action, and also the potential of using SOL116 for treatment of other inflammatory diseases. And, and later on, we believe that this altogether will constitute a package of knowledge and understanding that will be uh, attractive for other partners uh, in the pharma industry, but also in the academic and uh, hospital area for uh, joint development in the clinical program, but we could also consider out-licensing in particular of indications in the expanding indication group three, where we, where we don't bring them further on. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I hope that you have uh, some questions. As it happens, I do have some questions. Yeah, great. <laughs> it's like you knew. <laughs> I had a pretty good idea on that, yes. Um, now that you are heading towards clinical studies, I imagine that there will perhaps be an increased demand on, on your staff, of course, and on your uh, finances. Are we looking at expansion of staff? And how is the finances? No, actually, we have already expanded the staff, so to speak. We, we, we are a relatively neat organization. We have five full-time employees. We have added one scientist more this year. Uh, the, re the rest of the people are consultants on retainer or long term. With, um, so 
I don't think we will expand much more, but we, we, we certainly want to maintain our preclinical pre activity. So we have our own labs and we could consider to have more people in lab. Actually, we hire people from neighboring companies as well to maintain uh, uh, our own lab activities. And this is important too, because then we, we, we want to evaluate more opportunities of SOL116 in, in different types of models. Uh, uh, so from a cost perspective, we have actually peaked in cost because the CMC, the, the production of SOL116 under uh, good manufacturing practice and also executing the non-clinical program has been rather large cost that we had du mainly during last year. And the, the listing at, and the IPO uh, financed a lot of that. But nevertheless, uh, we have declared also in our uh, more recent quarterly report and the annual report that we will need more uh, funding during this year. And you talked a little bit here about the preclinical and maybe looking into other indications. How important is it to have more than one indication? <clears throat> I think that since we have invested a lot in the development of SOL116, I think it wouldn't make sense if we didn't explore more opportunities. And, and considering that preclinical studies are relatively inexpensive, so it makes sense to invest in a lot of different studies uh, to get results that you can use to attract interest from others that want to proceed and maybe continue that work into a, a clinical study. But we ourselves, we cannot go for for clinical studies on all the indications that will be impossible. But we focus on proof of concept in RA and we consider them to add on phase two studies in these other uh, three indications that we have listed so far. But uh, of course, the strategy is to take benefit of the value of SOL116. And then finally, where do you hope to see LIPUM in a year's time? Oh, there yeah, well, um, we will have, uh, in a year's time, we will, we will probably have the first result from a phase one study, but we have a rather conservative uh, uh, timetable. So we estimate that it takes one year from submission of a trial application before we have a final written report in our hand that we can talk about. So I don't want to give false expectations to those listening. Uh, this, uh, these things takes time. It's a double-blinded study, so it will at least take uh, six to eight months before we have a, uh, any day idea ourselves. And, and speaking of time, thank you for your time today. Thanks. My pleasure.